All right. Okay. So we are here with Rehan, Rehan Halawala. He is the founder and president of Super Technologies Inc., um, a U.S. United States-based company started in field software solutions for the telecom industry. And you actually have quite a number of um, companies as well. So I think you have like 13 is what I'm looking at this little uh, pamphlet here that says. Um, in, in different areas from Pakistan to United States, Malaysia, Singapore, Europe, which is a really awesome feat. And then we were earlier just talking a little bit about social media as well, and you like to teach people about starting their own businesses and entrepreneurship. So first, thank you for coming to our show and joining us. Thank you for inviting. Awesome. So um, I guess where to start? So you, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Like how did you get into entrepreneurship, into starting, I guess, 13 different companies, or founding at least 13 different companies? Um, so I come from a background of entrepreneurs. My dad has a business, my, his dad had a business, and um, um, the honest truth is I was bored. I, there was no TV, there was no cartoons, there was no YouTube, right? So what do I do? So I uh, started uh, a part-time business selling uh, Commodore 64 games um, out of my my home and I put an ad in the newspaper that you know I, I started initially from school mm -hmm. this would set it at school and then put an ad in the newspaper and then people will come in and say da son can you please call your dad Mr. Rehan it's like I'm Rehan no that's not possible <laughs> call your dad so that's how it started um, and then it was out of boredom basically and then um, my father would not take pay me pocket money so I had to earn my pocket money also so whatever I earned, I would go and buy magazines or you know, buy more games or uh, you know some food. I was never greedy for money. It was just like needed a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. So that's how I started. Cool. And so, just like a quick nerd question then. So you were selling Commodore sixty fours and stuff in the games. So like, was that like one of your hobbies? Like, how did you sell them? So I know in marketing, a lot of times it's like. So. They were just, we were just copying. Uh, there were no shops at that time for the game, so mm -hmm. I was just, I had a big library of games at my home. Mm -hmm. I would just give a copy and sell it off for 10 cents. Uh, and so, you know, somebody going for it, buying it for 30 bucks, which you cannot basically in Pakistan at that time. Uh, so I would just copy them for other people. And people just like neighborhood kids or like no i put an ad in the newspaper and there were no neighborhood kid who, kids who have computers nobody from even nearby had a computer it, this is like 1987 so it's like nobody had computers very few people had computers and those who did they would come and you know come to my home and you know sit with me and just ask me what games are new and i was just copied for them cool so then you kind of planted the seed there, um, and then you, so when you first started out doing, I guess like, I guess you wanted to make, um, I guess you, when you started your first company, I guess, like what was that process or experience like for you? Um, as I said, it was just to make some pocket money. Um, and my father did not even know, I was just hiding in and just, just doing part time, a few hours a day, two, three hours a day. Yeah. Um, it was interesting. Initially, I was scared, but I had some experience on and doing internship in some other computer shops, mm -hmm. which were there. Um, and with permission of my parents, I was going there every day and worked my summers. And actually, that's how I got the huge library. And then I was doing another internship in another space, which was in a different field. And that's where I started giving games to other shops also so I had like a huge library of games which almost nobody had and then um, you know it's a long story it'll take forever to if you, if you just went into that no I mean I guess how did you get into like um, telecom industry then like how did you make that so I got into telecom like um, so the, in 1995 I was selling email service it was really early nobody had nobody else there was no internet in Pakistan at that time uh, so we, I used to sell email for someone else, and I went to another city. I saw a franchise available for email service. I was like, oh, interesting. Why can't I just start my own business? Mm -hmm. So I started my own business, and uh, at that time, there were no forums. There were email mailing lists, which you could join, and then you had, like, chat rooms on email. So I, I saw an email from a person 
uh, from Florida looking for um, friends who could educate their her students in cultural values. And she was looking for people from Israel and India and other parts of the world. There was no Pakistan. And I was raised as a very, very patriotic person. Um, I was like, why isn't Pakistan there? So I, I was scared and I still replied, hi, I'm from Pakistan. Can I be your friend? And as you can see on my card now, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, um, and that person became my co-founder of the first company I started in the U.S. Okay. Uh, my company became partner in education with her school and we made the first website ever of any school in Florida. I had a huge article about me in the local Pensacola News Journal, uh, you know, newspaper, and that's how I started going into WIC, IP, and Internet Phone was just created as a software. The software called see you, see me, you could see each other. Um, she sent me a camera from the U.S. to start having a conversation with the kids. This is like pre-Skype, pre, like, you know, it sounds like a gazillion years ago. It was just like 20 years ago. Right. Yeah. And um, then I ex got, I liked the feel, I liked the technology, I was a geek. Uh, and um, then I made uh, friends with people like Jeff Pulver, who is like our grandfather in the VoIP industry. And we made the first phone call ever from the US to Pakistan over IP. Um, and it just got more and more complicated. I was, uh, I started traveling uh, and then I um, got agency for more VoIP companies, and then eventually I started my own branded product in 1999 in the U.S. Uh, by the name of Superphone. Cool. And it was a device you could use to make cheaper phone calls. Awesome. And so, <coughs> um, and the Superphone is no longer, right? Superphone, um, that product just died because you don't really need a device anymore. Everybody had, nobody, there was no cell phone at that time. People did not have cell phone in their pockets like we do have, especially smartphones. Mm -hmm. And when smartphones came over, um, all these apps like, you know, WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger, you don't really need, uh, that. The, the mobile has enough CPU power to do all that. Mm -hmm. So that, those products just died. Um, I mean, just like land f landlines are just dead or dying or coming back in some parts of the world but um, yeah so Superphone is now a product which offers like an app which you can download it works like WhatsApp and Skype okay. it's no longer a hardware box well I was going to say because I think that uh, well, I think the founder or well like uh, Instagram was saying that they were at TechCrunch I believe and saying that they you know comment on like why have you followed copied off of Snapchat, essentially. Um, and he was saying, well, that's part of innovation. Like, you either follow what's going on um, and adapt to it, or you get left behind. So would you say, in your experience as a business person, is that something you've encountered many times? Or? So Peter Thiel has a book called Zero to One, um, mm -hmm. and um, he defines uh, economy and entrepreneurship in different boxes. So like what China is doing right now and other countries have to do is follow what has already been done in the U.S., right? right. So India is making all those highways which were done in the U.S. in 1960. Uh, Pakistan is doing the same. China did the same. And the whole world needs those highways. And the same exact formula which worked in the U.S., everybody else is copying. And uh, copy excellence is actually what we do. We, we copy our parents. We copy our teachers. Whereas when somebody copies somebody else in the business, people think it's copying. It's not really copying. You can never copy. If you have a recipe for, say, biryani or any other dish, mm -hmm. uh, there's no way on earth you can make exactly the same biryani when you make it, your own style. You will add a little bit of this or a little bit of that, making it a unique biryani of yours rather than, or, or be it the, you know, like the fried chicken, for example, right? So everybody has their own recipe. A fried chicken is the chicken is the same, the, the the fryer is the same, the oil is the same. It's just a little bit of this or a little bit of that which makes, you know, KFC different than McDonald's and you know Harvard chicken or whatever. Yeah. So, in my opinion, copying is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Um, there's a saying, you know, great artists steal. I mean, copy. Uh, it's by Steve Jobs, I think. Great. Um, artist copy or artist copy and great artist steal or something like that like 
Steve Jobs went to Xerox and stole the mouse idea, right? I mean, it's, wh why do you call it stealing? It's inspired by Xerox, and you know, he made it a better mouse than yeah. other people. So, I I have no problem. I love people copying me. I would love for people to just everything I do is open source. I tell people, you know, to copy as much as you want, just just because. As a collection of humankind, we will be a better species if we could just copy better things, copy better processes and systems, and just become better human beings. So, why do you do open source then? Like, what is your? So, because there's seven billion people on the planet. Mm -hmm. If, in my opinion, if everybody take wheat or take bread making, if there was a patent on bread today. Mm -hmm. Or if some large corporation had a patent on bread, you know, we wouldn't be able to buy bread even. It'll be so expensive. Uh, so I believe that you know knowledge should be open and free for everyone to, to to take and have equal opportunity. Especially with nowadays, where you can anybody and everybody can has access to the same information. It's just sometimes the patents which stop us from growing that way. Why are drug companies so big now? Because of those mm -hmm. patents, and why is the same Panadol in the U.S. a dollar, and in Pakistan it's one cent? Why is that? Yeah. Uh, it's because of those patents and the lawyer fees and this fees and that fees. It becomes very expensive. So I think it's like a discrimination of a kind. Yeah. But then I think sometimes maybe here in America there is sort of like an idea that like if you make things open source then. I think it's part psychology where if things are open source, then sometimes people don't necessarily take it uh, serious or take it for granted. Like they don't necessarily respect or listen to it. So have you ever found that? I know um, we were talking earlier and you said like you teach people like marketing and uh, entrepreneurship and you do it for free open source. So do you ever find that happens? When you All the people? time. You, you, you said it. Because I do it for free and open source, I'm not as... Uh, popular as the people who charge for it. Because when you pay for something, you value it more. When something, we, do, How many times do we thank God for air we breathe in? Almost never, right? Because you know we take it for granted, it's free. The moment Nestle starts to package it and starts selling, okay, here's a premium version of air. <laughs> you would say, oh, I am using this particular brand of air now. It's like, like water used to be, right? Nobody was buying water before. Now all of a sudden, 20 years later, Everybody's drinking their brand of water, you know, whatever yeah. their small little tweak thing is. So I don't really appreciate making people abusing. I, this to me is like an abuse uh, of um, something. But it works for a lot of people. Apple is more, of, of course, makes more money than Google does. And however, there's still more Android phones, and Android does more better for the world than Apple's phone does, in my opinion. But Apple is making more money. Apple is the richest com company in the world now because of it's all closed source. You can't do anything on Apple without Apple's permission. True. Whereas Android is all open and all, all free. However, I think Android makes more impact on the planet, which people don't realize because it's free. Right. No, that's a good point, though. I was reading an article um, kind of staying in the tech field. <coughs> it was, uh, I think it was someone from Red Hat and they were talking about because, or as Red Hat is a very open and open source is actually a way for people to necessarily discover people's talents as well. Um, because if you're, let's say, creating code for a website or something, you have to submit to um, GitHub or whatnot, and then people see, they, it's kind of a way to vouch for each other. Like you put your work out there and someone says, I know this guy can do this, or this guy can't really do this, or this girl or whoever can't really do this, um, but they're a great person, they like to learn. So is that something that maybe you find as well um, with an open source or as an entrepreneur, like vouching for people and kind of getting to know people? Um, I have for sure found good friends through open source network, but then you can find through closed source network also, right? right. Um, uh, say you're very Muslim, so we find <coughs> people through our Muslim network. Mm -hmm. We're on Muslim radio right now, right? So, uh, but however, at the same time, Jewish people probably have a Jewish radio network and they find people through their, their their network so I don't say it's a wrong it's just not my way I prefer that I want to see a planet where everybody is actually equal and equal uh, has equal opportunity uh, so if we actually close the source yes one or two companies or I might make a lot of money 
and it might actually be better service. However, it, in my heart, it, I would not be doing justice to what my belief system is. It's not that it's right or wrong, as I said. Right. Um, uh, Facebook is doing a lot good for the world. It's, it is closed source. It sues everyone who copies it. Uh, but at the same time, it is doing, it's trying to spread Facebook all over the globe, even though it's closed to network. But it is still really, really good tool for the bottom of the pyramid of the people because all of a sudden, people see the world in a very different way without even paying for it. For example, in Pakistan, you uh, you don't get clean water, you don't get electricity, but you get free Facebook on your phone. You don't have to pay for data service. You just buy a phone, put a free SIM card, turn the phone on, and you're on Facebook. And that's uh, not just in Pakistan, it's in 80 other countries in the world. Mm -hmm. So it's a great way to, to connect to the planet. And then you actually talk about that in your book, um, Add Me, which is like making friends and via Facebook and like the advantages. Is that something else you talk about in your book, but then also like the ability to, I guess, one of the advantages, uh, I guess, of Facebook is being able to maybe go further than you ever will. Yeah. Um, I think we live in a very, very interesting time. I think we are all as humanity connected. Mm -hmm. However, we don't leverage our connections. We don't understand them. And anything you don't understand, you don't really cannot leverage. So I started a program two years ago where I started offering free laptops to steal my friends. So um, I, if anybody comes to my Facebook, takes 500 of my Facebook friends, I give them a smartphone. If they come into my Facebook, take 1,200 of my Facebook friends, I give them a free laptop. And if somebody comes with 1,500 of my friends, take them and convince them to become their friends. I give them a partnership, I make them a partnership offer in, in their business, in their dream, whatever their dream is. Mm -hmm. Why do I do this? Is because my Facebook friends are phenomenal human beings like Steve Wozniak, Steve Case, um, who's who of the world I have collected over time and I keep on refining my list all the time. Right? Mm -hmm. So if I meet a more interesting person, I would unfriend a less interesting person, a friend, because there's a limit of 5,000 people on Facebook. Right. So there was a uh, uh, the, uh, the the theory where uh, they say you're a sum of your friends, right? Mm -hmm. So you're the sum of your friends' network. And <coughs> another saying is that if your five of your best friends are millionaires, you will be the sixth one. So I wanted to see if it actually works over social media, mm -hmm. and I wanted to see if people added my friends who are really amazing human beings, would these people become amazing human beings or not? And that's why I started the experiment. I've given 300 laptops so far, and 300 laptops later, I, I have now a palindra of uh, data, which uh, I'm going to come out and publish as a white paper and a book, which explains that how people's mindset just changes just by changing their social network, friends list, and they can excel in anything they want. So because now they have powerful friends, they have uh, knowledge of all those friends in their disposal, mm -hmm. and uh, they can do almost anything they want. So people who are living in other parts of the world um, will probably never, 99% of the planet, I think, will never travel all around the globe, mm -hmm. or even other countries, uh, but they can be connected on Facebook. That's kind of interesting then. So. What do you, how do people necessarily branch out? Because I think that's something I've been in a lot of entrepreneur groups and we've had a, a lot of conversations <coughs> about, you know, how do you reach out to people? How do you make connections with, you know, top performers or, you know, VIP people? That's kind of the uh, phrases that they use. Um, but how do you, you just teach people as well, like how to actually connect to people or? Yeah. So that's what the book is all about, basically, how you reach out to people is by improving yourself. Everything in the end is about you, it's not about them. Um, if you want, say, a, uh, say Richard Branson to be your friend, or uh, Bill Gates to be your friend, or whoever you want, say a really high goal, right? Mm -hmm. You have to be someone which has something to offer to these people. And if you are a nobody, how, why would somebody want to be your friend? Right. So this process, which I, 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 one of my learnings in this process was that people who were nobodies came into my Facebook network, started to friend these people, and they had to make these, that's why they have this numbering score, 500, 1200, 1500. 
they have to go out and clean up their profile. They have to go out and put a nice Facebook photo. They have to go out and write information about who are they. Why would a random person just friend you? They would not. You would have to be presentable enough for them to say, okay, I will kick off somebody so I can add you. I really like you and I would like to be your friend. And it's about creating yourself. You create yourself. It's a competition with yourself, not with other people. So you go out there and you create a profile for yourself that you are likable enough that that other person wants to be your friend. And on that journey, you find who you are. What are you all about? What is your passion? What would be your story to tell to other people? And that will that is a journey which most people take forever in their life in physical world to do. And here they can do it in a few months because now they are trying to friend these amazing group of people. First, you have to find these amazing group of people. Then you have to like, you know, request them. Now my friends are already expecting that they would be bombarded with friend requests. Right. And some of them have unfriended me because of this. Uh, they don't like what I'm doing, uh, which is fine. Uh, but the learning which has come out of it shows that uh, they, they really become amazing. And there is a saying, there is a quote by Imam Ghazali, that I went to look for God for two years. I couldn't find God, but I found myself. And the same way, they're actually coming for the laptop, but they actually end up learning who are they themselves because they have to tell you their story over and over to so many people. They, they, they stick with their own story now, that this is who I am, this is what I'm going to do. But then, do you ever, I ever wonder, like, sometimes, do the other people ever feel inauthentic when they're telling their story? Or, like, because I think there's a... Maybe like a slight authentic or inauthentic. Either one, inauthentic, I suppose. Um, just because if you're not familiar with the idea of telling yourself and telling your story, that could be. It's learning. That's what we nobody even ever teaches you in school. Yeah. I don't like schools anymore. I don't want people to go to school because of this reason. Because we are not teaching the right things. We need to teach people how to become human beings. We don't teach them how to be human beings who are able to interact be able to connect, be able to make a stranger into a friend, be able to ask authentically to someone, I really need your help because so and so and so. How do you present yourself for doing that? Um, Napoleon Hill's book, How to Make Friends and Influence People, the richest man in the world, what's his name? The older person? Mm -hmm. uh, Buffet. Buffet, Warren Buffet says that he, that course by Napoleon Hill changed his life and that's who made him in because that course taught us how to actually be a human being. How do you interact with other human beings? How do you actually deal with that? And the school system, unfortunately, has failed, in my opinion, to do that. We don't teach how to actually collaborate. We are always trying to compete with everybody else. We don't teach collaboration in the way where it really should be. Mm -hmm. And this process teaches collaboration and the self-discovery of who are you. And it's an ongoing process, I think. It's, it goes on for a very long time. Um, it, it's, it's a long journey. I'm still discovering who I am. Yeah. But I think you, you mentioned school, and I think that's a good point, though, is that we are a lot taught to compete against each other. Um, and so part of that is like, I guess the idea of that's what makes you distinctive, right? Like, obviously, if you have straight A's, then that's what makes you stand out to people. And so I think that's part of, like, a means of, in some ways, grabbing attention, right? If you have all these, you know, people who have, thousands of people who are super busy, like, if you say, I'm a Harvard-bound graduate, and I have, you know, straight A's and great GPA, and I'm working with so and so such, that it stands out more obviously and you might have more value to offer somebody so I personally think that that was a very good way to find people mm -hmm. and be able to distinctly stand out mm -hmm. it was a very good way now <coughs> I think it's no longer the right way to do it uh, and we need we are in the process of reinventing the entire education process I I you can, you know, just like you have BC and, you know, AD, I think there's post-internet time, post-YouTube time, and post-Facebook time. 
and then now you can have post Hanak Edme time, post edX time, and post Coursera time. So because of all these innovations happening in the last five years of restructuring and rethinking how education should work, the one thing which is a big problem right now is accreditation. And uh, how do you distinguish what is this person worth to you or value of that person in terms of knowledge? Right. Do you have to have a Harvard degree in order to be a good person or you just have to know that thing in order to be a good person in that? So again, in the Zero to One b book by Peter Thiel, he's explaining that it's not necessarily the education, it's the filtration process which Harvard has, which Stanford has, which grad gets the best of the world already in their, in, their, in their class. So the people who are coming there are already best in the world mm -hmm. because of the filtration process, because of the, the way they have to separate you know, good from bad. So that is what needs to be scaled on the, in the world, in my opinion, uh, for finding the right human beings. Um, there are a lot of people, including me, who are working on solving that problem. We, I have a project called insan.net, which is humans, which means in humans. Mm -hmm. It's like a search engine for finding human beings. Um, you know, we cannot find human beings correctly right now. It's a very, very challenging problem as of right now you know we can find information we google finds it for us but you can't find the right human being for the right job at the right place right now i think uh, once that problem is solved this huge thing will be solved because we have data points available on the internet and those data points will be collected and artificial intelligence can be used to judge instantly if this person can or be bad for you so that's a little I guess complicated though, because you have people who necessarily, I think you talked about like in your book, like meeting out and reaching to people. How do you, I think there's some people who might not necessarily know how to articulate themselves, but Most it's necessarily don't. mean, right. So they I don't. wasn't, I was one of them. Right. I absolutely did not know how to have a conversation. Right. So then how do you, I mean, is it just, again, just comes down to like you have, like that person has to learn how, or yeah. is it... So I, I guess my, my, my head and my thought is right now is like, but what if you miss out on someone, you know, because it's a communication error? Or is it more like... I, I still do. Yeah. A lot of times. Yeah. So then I guess it's just that person it's life. and you move on because there's other people or... It's life. We have to... It's not... This is not the ultimate life, right? This is a journey. Right. And on that journey, we learn... Um, to respect other people's comfort zone a little bit and at the same time kick their asses a little bit if we can. Um, but it's a journey and everybody's on their own journey, right? So the only thing we have influence upon a little bit is our own self. So if we become better and if we become content, everything around us does change and it, has, it happens like magic. Uh, I don't know how to explain it, but if we are if we work on ourselves, which, you know, I love the Romy's quote, it is, you know, on a big wall in our office. First, I was smart and I tried to change the world and then I became a little wise and I started working on myself. So if we actually correct ourselves on the communication skills and the speaking skill and the accent skill and the language skills, it will eventually make us a better person. And that's all we can do. We cannot control everything in the world, but we can control a little bit of our brain, which is very hard because 95% is subconscious, which is very hard to control. Um, yeah. So we can learn, and it's like cycling. We have to practice a lot. We have to let go of our fears. Mm -hmm. We have to let go of our, you know, and bring out a little bit courage. And then everything starts to change. Um, and then potentially last question, um, <laughs> unless you don't have, a, have time need to go. Um, I guess what I was last thinking is just, uh, I think someone was mentioning how, um, so there's sort of the idea that in investment theory, it's mainly popped up, um, you put things out, right, and you know that, I guess investors kind of know that like four things are probably going to fail, four out of five are going to fail and they're kind of betting on that one thing to make up for all the lost money that they had within those last four. I'm guessing I'm applying it socially. Could that possibly be something that people can look forward to? Like if I mess out and on these other people, maybe one day I can get myself to position and 
bring that make, person back in your life? You don't bring the person back in your life. Maybe they're just gone, but maybe make up for the lost work that you were not able to do through other means. I don't think there's a lost work. It's all a learning. Yeah. If somebody, if, if say you are having a conversation and you offended someone, that's a learning that this is something you did which offended them. And at the same time, it's okay to offend them. Um, I was just, um, I have every single day I spend eight to ten hours on talking to people, at least on chat. Mm -hmm. um, they come up to me, they want this help or that help, but they're not willing to take help from anybody else, but they want me to help personally. That's really impossible for me to do as a human being. Right. Uh, because they are scared of other people, but they're not scared of me as much because I put a lot of content out there and I'm like a familiar face for them it's like TV actors it's like right. uh, so that's why I was asking you to turn on your follower function have a lot of following go out there and you will for sure offend a lot of people a lot of people but it doesn't mean anything it's just a journey and it's their problem they got offended it's not us who offended them once you're sure about that, it would not bother you anymore. And that's, I think that's how we should live, that we should not, not let other people's words and actions control our, uh, us. If somebody says a bad thing to us, it does not mean that we should get angry. We should we could just smile, just like you know the prophet did, and the woman who was throwing garbage on him, and he was still not being offend, you know, offense, I'll go and kill her. You know, we don't, he didn't do that, right. you know. So, but we today, we go like, you try that and I'll show you what can happen. <laughs> yeah. So we shouldn't do that. We should not, I, I, t I say that we should not give uh, our lives remote control in other people's life. What are we, a remote control TV or something that somebody can press one button and we go like, rrr, rrr, rrr. why, why, why do we get angry? We, it's in our own uh, it's our own ability to control our anger. Mm -hmm. We should not give remote control of our life to other people to make us angry, offended, upset. Uh, if, they, if they were not supposed to be in our life, they were not supposed to be in our life. You know, it, it, We did everything we could, and it happens to me all the time. I mean, I, I could be as nice as possibly I can, I still offend them. Yeah. Why are you so nice to me? I'm, I'm offended. You know, like that's even I have heard that even. even. <laughs> so that's how do I how do I fix that? Maybe one day I'll learn, but I don't know for now. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Any advice to Muslims before we head out? Yes, um, I had a question with our a really amazing uh, j uh, friend who founded the Care, and he said uh, I asked what should Muslims do, and his his answer was beautiful. His answer was We're in the limelight right now. Do your dance. Show the people who are you. Show the people who Muslims are. Uh, go out there. Don't hide. But just be in the limelight. You are in the limelight. Do your dance. Uh, show who you are. And show your. Be open. Have a big smile. And live your life. Don't let anybody offend you. If anybody out there is listening to me and who knows some uh, stalker, offender, hater, Islamophobia, please connect me to them on Facebook. I would be so happy to talk to them. I would love to have a conversation with them. I love those people because they're the one who make me a better person. And uh, if I would, I would be, I mean, I'm, I'm actually out of haters. I really need more. Uh, I need to go out and find those people who I can actually learn from. And I want to see how are they behaving? Why are they thinking the way they are? Yeah. Um, and it's, there's so much learning. One of the guy on my Facebook, um, he is always, always, every single post offends with bad words about Islam. I actually spent a night at his house in Germany. I went to his house especially to see him, and he was the sweetest guy on the planet. But he has he's heard somewhere that he's constantly offending. He's offended, as you said earlier, yeah. that he's offended by religion. Because his learning is that you know religion has done so many bad things for so many people, right. but that's his learning. That doesn't mean religion did something wrong. It's the people who understood it in the wrong way did something wrong. So I love those people in terms of people who hate. I would love to be introduced to the people who scare you. Okay. So then, how can we reach you? Either to give you our 
worst sure, people are. The best way in the world is Facebook me. Is, is, uh, my name is Rehan, R E H A N. My Facebook uh, ID is Rehan33. Just write my name. My, if you write Rehan, I'm the first one on Facebook. If you, um, you can go to Rehan.com. Um, that's the best way to reach me. Personally, I write on my wall. If I don't see me, you write again. If I don't see you, write again. And uh, I do spend a lot of time answering people. I do my best. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Rehan, for joining us. Thank you so much. Awesome. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam.